Well, good morning, Parkview, and Merry Christmas. Man, it's an absolute joy and a real treat to be with you this morning, just the day after Christmas. want to especially um, welcome our family from East and from North Campus. Um, it's just good to be together as, as one people, and so I want to thank you for uh, East and North kind of adjusting your plans to, to make it work for us to meet here this morning. Um, as Will mentioned just at the beginning of the service, if you're new here, I also just want to welcome you. I want to make it real clear for you um, this morning what we're about as a church. As, as Will mentioned at the top of the service, Parkview Ch Church exists to glorify God through the whole church, forming whole disciples of Jesus for the good of all people. Now, that language may seem a little interesting, this idea of the whole church forming whole disciples. And so uh, what we want to do over the course of the next couple of weeks is kind of zoom in on one phrase specifically there, and you'll see it. Oh, there it is right there. Whole disciples. Okay? Um, the series over the next couple of weeks is going to be sort of zooming in on this idea of uh, being a whole disciple of Jesus. A whole disciple. What we long to see happen here is to see men and women, boys and girls, be presented and, and grow towards maturity in Christ um, as, a, as a follower of Jesus. And one of the ways that we've sort of defined that in the last couple of months here at Parkview, what is a disciple of Jesus? Essentially, we've kind of boiled it down to this. A disciple is an individual who learns Jesus, who loves Jesus, and who lives Jesus, right? So a disciple is somebody whose mind is engaged as they learn Christ, right? And, and not just is their mind engaged, but also their heart, their affections. They, they grow a love for Jesus, and they continually grow in this love for Jesus. But it just doesn't stop at the, the head and the heart. It also impacts their hands, the, the, the actual things that we do, the, 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 there's tremendous implications on the way that we live our life and just taking one step of faithful obedience after another. And so a whole disciple is an individual who every aspect of their life is brought underneath the reign and the rule of King Jesus as they grow in their relationship with him. And so what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks here, just to kind of launch the beginning of the calendar year here, is we're going to, again, zoom in on this idea of whole disciple. And collectively, together, we are going to consider sort of different, uh, different elements that go into forming these whole disciples. And you'll see them kind of up there on the wall. We're, we're going to spend some time considering this morning, as Will mentioned, the gathering. Sunday morning, the gathering, the, the worship gathering of God's people. We'll, we'll spend some time then after that looking at the Bible and the, the important critical role that the Bible plays in the formation of disciples. Then we'll look at prayer and the prayer life of a disciple and what it should look like and how it's important for us to, to grow. Prayer is an important element of our discipleship. And then finally, we'll consider together service and just ministry. What does it look like to serve Jesus and his people in ministry? So these are sort of four different critical aspects of our spiritual formation that we will just sort of focus on for the next couple of weeks. And to help us this morning, this is, um, like I said before, it's an unusual day. All three campuses here together for one service. It's an unusual um, sermon. And so we're going to, it's going to be a little different approach. Okay. Historically, what we do here on a Sunday morning is we open up God's word and we exposit usually one passage at a time. This morning is more of a sort of a vision casting for what Sunday morning should look like, giving you a vision for what Sunday worship looks like. And so we'll use Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 25 to sort of launch the message, um, but we'll, we'll be in a variety of different places, okay? So it's going to be a little unusual in terms of just how we approach um, and preach God's word this morning. That being said, I would invite you to turn, if you have your Bibles, and I, I sure hope that you do, I'd invite you to take them out, open them up, and go to Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm going to read for us uh, chapter 10 verses 19 through 25, and then I will pray for our time together. This is God's word. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great, pre great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, 
for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity that we have right now to meet together as your people. Lord, with our, our Bibles open, um, we ask that you would um, speak to us through your word, which is true and eternal. Lord, we ask that you would write it on our hearts and that you would use your word this morning to shape us into the people that you have called us to be. Lord, we ask specifically, even now as we think about Sunday mornings, Lord, that you would um, give us a shared vision for what it is that we're even doing right now this morning. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let me ask you a question. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Nine o'clock on a Sunday morning, the day after Christmas, why are you here? What are you doing? Have you found yourself maybe recently ever just wondering, you know, find yourself in an environment where you're wondering, asking yourself that question? Um, in the days leading up to Christmas, there were multiple trips, and many of you could maybe lament along with me, multiple trips by myself to hy V. Multiple trips, one after the other. Um, oftentimes would go there for one, two, maybe three or four things, and several times in the last couple of weeks, I found myself meandering through the aisles of High V, and after just a few minutes, all I knew was I was supposed to be there, all right? But it would take me a few minutes, minutes to just re remind myself what in the world I was doing there. What were the three things I was supposed to get? Find myself walking through High V, thinking, why am I here? Maybe students, there's some students with us. Maybe you found yourself in a classroom recently. Hopefully not, right? It's a familiar setting. The teacher in front of you, you know that person. The classmates around you, you know these individuals. But the, the lesson that's being instructed maybe is, is, is something that you've not been paying attention to for the last few minutes. And suddenly a question gets asked and you stop and you think to yourself, what are we doing? What are we doing? Found yourself in that situation. One of the, the, the most common times that I find myself asking the question, what am I doing here, is when I go to North Dodge Gym and get there at the beginning and step on the treadmill and hit whatever, go. And the thing starts moving, and after about three or four minutes, I'm thinking to myself, who am I kidding? What, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I doing this? I despise the treadmill, can't stand it. But it's just habit. Just get on it, and I just run and try to get my blood going and heart rate up and you know, but after a few minutes, what in the world am I doing here? Maybe some of you this morning, or any Sunday morning for that, find yourself sitting in church, familiar setting, a familiar place, faces and names around you that you know, week after week, asking yourself this question, what in the world am I doing here? That question is precisely what we're going to try to answer this morning. Why are we here? Why are we here? To sort of explore an answer to this question and to kind of give a vision for what we ought to be doing here on Sunday mornings, we're going to just sort of see three things together. The first is we're going to consider the priority of our gathering. The priority of our gathering. Secondly, we will look at and consider together the purpose of our gathering. And then finally we will consider together the plan of our gathering. Priority, the purpose, and the plan. Have you ever wondered what the whole theme of the Bible is? There's been lots of, lots of work on this, lots of threads that you could trace from one, from the beginning of the Bible to the, to the end of the Bible, but lots of many possible answers to this question. Jeremiah 33, 31 helps us form an answer. A good job of summarizing a thread that runs throughout all of Scripture. It says this, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
This is, this is a reality. This is a theme, a thread that we see traced, woven throughout all of Scripture, that God will be our God and we will be his people. In fact, at the very end of the Bible, when you get to Revelation chapter 21, you're given this image, an, an image of what, what is awaiting for us, our future eternal destiny. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. In short, if you wanted to think about a theme of the entire Bible, boil it down into one phrase, you could say this, God wants to be with us. In fact, we just had an entire Advent season that is reminding us of this remarkable, revolutionary idea. God wants to be with us, with you. He wants to be with you. That is cause for tremendous celebration. And here in Hebrews, we are reminded that with Christ's perfect sacrifice leading the way, drawing near to God is not just for you and for me a possibility. It's what we're called to do. Drawing near to God is a tremendous privilege for us, and it is a total gift of grace. In verses 19 through 22, um, the author summarizes what has already been established in the letter about who Jesus is and all that he has done. Using the imagery of, of a temple curtain that blocked off the intersection of the temple. This barrier would have surrounded the holy of holies, effectively separating the presence of God from the people of God. And when Jesus died, this veil we know was torn from top to bottom, giving all of us access to the actual presence of God himself. And because of this reality, because of what Jesus has done, we are to draw near to God through Jesus and continue to gather. That's what the text says. Th through the book, we're shown how Jesus replaces the central focus of Israel, Israel's gathering, the temple, the priest, the sacrifice. And yet the author insists that while Jesus has done that, we must continue to gather the, the gathering's purpose shifts from the, the work as it did in the Old Testament of the priests and now from, from their, the work that they did performing sacrifices. And now the, the focus is on the work of the people. It says encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The passage will then go on, if you continue to read, to, to warn of the dangers, what might be, how people could potentially fall away from the faith. And his point is obvious. The gathering of the church is one key for holding fast under the pressures of a broken world and temptations to sin. How do you, how do we as a people expect to have any degree of success, any degree, any measure of growth in maturity towards Christ if we neglect to meet together? I don't know that we can. He exhorts them, do not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some. So the implication is obvious. There are some that are neglecting this priority. They're not prioritizing the weekly gathering, the corporate worship of God. They're not prioritizing, they're neglecting it. Why? We don't know for sure, but we can make some assumptions. Of course, when this was written, there was tremendous persecution of the church would have faced. And so certainly, if you wanted to maybe avoid the persecution, you would avoid the gathering, right? It'd be one way to avoid it. There could be other reasons, perhaps, and maybe some that, that maybe are more, um, maybe more relevant for us. Something like, well, there's just, there's just a lot going on, right? There's just... There's just so much activity. Life is just so busy. You know, yes, it's important, but there's all these other things that we have to do, right? There's kids' activities. There's the growing career. There's classes and all of the studies that we have to endure. There's just so much 
going on. Another reason could be, I mean, just think of, all, there, there's so many reasons. In today's day and age, you think of just technology and the amount of options that are available at your fingertips, at home, in the comfort of your living room, sitting on your couch, right? Suddenly, the, the world has opened up to you. Yeah, yeah, I can see some benefit in coming together, but look at all this phenomenal stuff that I have access to right here in the comforts of my own home. Lots of reasons we could potentially make as well. But God's word is eternal and it is true. Do not neglect meeting together as is the habit of some. The word spoken then had significance and meaning and power. And guess what? It does today as well. We must prioritize the weekly gathering. We must. Scripture is very clear on this point. Secondly, as we consider just the need to prioritize it, let's think for a few minutes about the purpose. Okay, it's important. I should be at church on Sunday. I mean, come on. Shouldn't, I, shouldn't you expect me to say that every week? Right? Shouldn't, shouldn't I say that? Why? Why? Well, let me give you just a, a quick statement of what we, uh, the elders, believe to be the purpose of Sunday morning gathering. I'll just read this. I think it might be on the screen. There it is. Yeah. We believe that the purpose of the Sunday gathering is to see God glorified and his people transformed as we proclaim God's word and respond to him together. What are we here for? That. Precisely that. We want to see God glorified. We want to see his church built up and this community transformed. And one of the ways that we do that is we prioritize our weekly gathering. We meet together weekly. As we meet together weekly, you could think of the purpose. There's multiple purposes that are happening here on a Sunday morning. And you can see them in that language. Multiple things that we long to see accomplished, that we invite you to participate in on a Sunday morning, regardless of which campus you attend. The first thing is, is that we believe the sort of the primary purpose of our Sunday morning worship service should be for the exaltation of the triune God. This probably goes without saying, hopefully, for us. It is, after all, a worship service, right? We long to see the triune God exalted. Here's the deal. Whether you know it or not, whether you agree with it or not, the truth is we were all designed for worship. Many of us may, maybe realize that. We were all designed for worship. Dostoevsky has a wonderful quote where he says, So long as man remains free... He strives for nothing so incessantly and so painfully as to find someone to worship. It is buried deep in our bones, looking, longing for something, someone that transcends our experiences, that we ascribe our worship to. Every single one of us longs for that. And what unites us here in this place on this day, on Sunday morning, when we gather together as his people, is that the object of our worship is the triune God himself. We gather here to worship him. It's the primary purpose. You know, our family loves to take road trips. And the greatest, you know, for us, talk a lot about it, we just drive out west and sometimes get in the car and we're not really sure where we're going or how it's all going to work out, but we just drive. It's one of the most therapeutic things for me is just an open road at like 3 a.m. with silence in the back seat. And I feel like the only way I can do it is get in the car, we're going, you know. Um, it's just, it's really, it's really therapeutic. And one of the things I love about driving out west is you get into the, some of the, the beautiful states. Now, Iowa's beautiful too. Don't get me wrong. There's lots of beautiful states here. But specifically love Wyoming and Montana. And when you, when you get out into just God's creation and you see just hills and, and valleys and streams. And there's, there's several uh, spots in, in Montana that as we're, we're driving, oftentimes what will happen is we'll be driving along the road and, and you'll, you'll take a turn and all of a sudden a view will just open up and it will just be so majestic. You can't help but just pull over the car. And what I want to do sometimes, and I don't know, if some, maybe it's hopefully not breaking any laws, is just get out of the car and, so, and just fling myself into the majesty, Right? Just like run into the field or tip, dip our toes into the water. Enter into 
the majesty of God's creation, not see it sort of through a windshield as it passes you by. And Sunday morning is an opportunity for us to very similarly enter into, draw near to God's majesty, to not keep him at a distance, but to, to sing of his praises, to join the chorus of his saints as we proclaim his goodness, to joyfully respond to who God is and, and what he's done throughout creation and redemption and what he will do. It's, it's our chance to draw near to God and exalt him in praise. Worship is about God from start to finish. It's not all it's about, though. Worship is about the exaltation of the triune God, but it's also about the formation of God's people. As we said before, we exist to glorify God through the whole church, forming whole disciples of Jesus for the good of all people. Clearly, there is more uh, that goes on at Parkview than just what happens here on a Sunday morning. There's group life. There's a variety of ministries and programs for all walks of life, all ages. And they're all designed to accomplish this, to move us closer to Jesus and to give us the opportunity to look at others around us and, and move our brothers and sisters closer to Jesus. They're all designed to form us into disciples, those who, who learn, who love, and who live Christ. There are different spaces or environments that we provide to help us grow in Christ. However, of all the ministry opportunities that are offered, our Sunday morning, morning gathering remains the primary occasion where the whole church is edified through, the, uh, edified through the ministry of the Word and the ministry of the Spirit of God. What happens when we gather sets the tone really for our entire community as a church. It, it, it reminds us of our purpose. It, it builds our culture. And as a people, it forms our character, our, our affections even for Jesus. And here's the deal, church. This is why this is so crucial, so critical for us, is because the reality is, is that we're all being formed, right? We're all being formed throughout the week, the world outside of the church would love to form you. It would love to shape you. And it tries to do just that through things like social media, through things like Netflix subscriptions, through things like the cable news channel, through the classroom, in the workplace. The world wants to shape us and to form us into its image, what it values what it thinks the good life looks like. It wants to shape our mind and our, our hearts. It wants to direct our activity and our behavior. The weekly gathering is an opportunity for us to come together as a people and to say, no thanks. <laughs> to recalibrate our minds and our hearts to who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Sunday mornings, we gather together to, to worship. It, it serves as a necessary opportunity to retune our hearts to God's and, and to remind us of what God has done and how much he loves us. There's something so, so remarkable, so powerful about walking in this room after a hard week, a week that's been maybe filled with total failure, frustration, discouragement, maybe you dropping one ball after another, to walk into this room with the community of God's people and be reminded that you are not alone. Reminded that, that God is in total control. No matter how crazy things seem, that he is still on the throne and that we are his people. I do not know about you, but I know I need that reminder. And there is something so powerful when we gather together and, and sing songs of praise to God and we hear each other through song reminding each other of these glorious truths. Martin Luther said this, at home in my own house, there is no warmth or vigor in me. Maybe you can relate to Martin Luther on this one. 
I know certainly there are times when I can. But in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. That is precisely what we long to see happen for every single one of us when we gather on Sunday mornings. That a fire is stoked and kindled in our hearts. And it, as we walk out these doors on a Sunday morning, it is just bursting through us, giving us the fuel that we need just to go on sometimes. Sunday mornings forms us as a people. Third purpose that is for the exaltation of the triune God, it is formation of God's people, but it's also for the proclamation of the gospel to the watching world. Our weekly gatherings have just one more primary purpose. It is to proclaim to the watching world that Jesus is king, he alone is mighty to save, and offers them the hope that they desperately need. In the book of Psalms, um, we read that we are, we are uh, commanded to declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among all peoples. And just as they were to declare the wonders of God to their own people, to the nation of Israel, they were also, as God's people, to proclaim God's goodness, his glory, to the nations around them. That was a fundamental aspect of what he had designed them to do. And in the New Testament, when the early church gathered, it was, it was just assumed that in their midst, that unbelievers would be there, would be among them. When they gathered. And so Paul provides instruction on how they are to worship in light of this inevitability. While we are a community of God's people, we are unique, we are different from the world around us, we are called to be a compelling community of God's people. And so, as I even think of recently the training nights that Pastor Hope walked us through to the, the, the um, what was the name of the book? The, uh, how to Share Jesus Without Being That Guy. That's what it was, all right? So kind of let us in how do we live a life of evangelism and share the gospel with people around us. And, and the reality is if we embrace that call that God has placed on our life as a church of whatever number we are, if every one of us understands that that, that is a calling that God has placed and we embrace that and we begin to think through, how do, I, how do I share Jesus with my neighbors? How do I share Jesus at the workplace? How do I share Jesus in the classroom? How do I share Jesus with my family members? If we, if we are equipped to do that, the reality is the effect will be among us every week, this room will have non-believers here. Because they've been rubbing elbows with us throughout the week. That they've seen, they've heard God's word, and they want, they want to see it for themselves. Right? And so if we embrace this call, we should assume every week that there are those in our midst who are not walking with the Lord, who have not received the gift of salvation. In fact, this morning, there are those here, I guarantee you. And what we long for you to do as you come into this room, as you enter into this building, is that from the beginning of this, even walking and driving into the parking lot, that you would get a glimpse of the glory of God, of his holiness and of his, his, his majesty. And just like Dave had done earlier, you would then recognize your need for his, his activity in your life, his saving power as you reflect on your sin. And your response would simply be to throw yourself at the feet of the cross, to receive the gift of salvation that comes through the, the shed blood of Jesus. And then you would be sent out of this place on a Sunday morning with a fire kindled in your heart and some real clear ideas of what some next steps are for you to grow in obedience to Jesus. The hope would be that, that just coming here, every, whether it's through confession, whether it's through the preaching of the word, whether it's through the singing of songs, whether it's through an encounter in the, in the lobby, that, that you would get a clear, a clear, articulated expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ every Sunday. Tim Keller says this, God wants the world to overhear us worshiping him. He directs his people not to simply worship, but to sing his praises before the nations. We are not to simply communicate the gospel to them, but to celebrate the gospel before them. 
And so every Sunday morning that we gather as God's people, as his saints, and we proclaim his majesty and his praise, it is a testimony to those who do not know him. So, that's the purpose. Threefold. Exaltation of the triune God, the formation of God's people, and the proclamation of the gospel to the watching world. And I think it's in that order, if that helps, okay? All right, finally, what is the plan for us as we gather? Sunday mornings are so critical for us. And if you leave here just knowing one thing, this is the one thing you should know. Public worship matters to God, and it should matter to you too, okay? If it's so important for us, if, there, if we long to see God exalted, us formed as his people, and his gospel proclaimed to the world around us, if we long to see that happen, then we must give great detail and attention to how. How does this happen on a Sunday morning? It doesn't just, does it just happen by itself? Additionally, it's abundantly clear throughout Scripture that God is concerned not only that we worship Him, but how we worship Him. How we worship Him, how we approach God, actually matters to God. And you see this all throughout Scripture, from really what was sort of the, the first passage in the Bible explicitly about worship, Cain and Abel. You see it in the first five of the Ten Commandments. You see the judgment comes upon Israel when they turn away from Yahweh and they give their worship to the golden calf. We see it in God's concern for how his people worship him and a great level of detail that he provides for how they build the tabernacle and the, and the temple. We see God's concern for how they approach him and the institution of the sacrificial system all throughout the Old Testament, the, the entire book of Malachi. God cares how you worship him. We see it in the New Testament when Jesus, maybe you're familiar with the story in John chapter 4, when he meets with the woman on the well, he says, but the hour is coming and is now here. When true worshipers, what Jesus, what God wants to make, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking to, such, to build, seeking such people to worship him. You see it in 1 Corinthians when Paul goes from chapter 11 to chapter 14 providing specific instructions for the people in Corinth on how they are to worship God. You get a glimpse in Revelation chapter 7 that the, 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 the picture that we're left with in the Bible, that what is happening, that there's a number, numberless multitude from every nation, people group, and language imaginable standing before the throne of God. Our ultimate future God's good purpose for his creation. That a people who are sheltered by him forever with his presence in turn ascribe him worship and praise. We meet together weekly in anticipation of this final gathering of God's people around the throne. God cares how we approach him in worship. It matters to him, so it should matter to us. As we think through what do we do on a Sunday morning as a team, as leaders, um, we have sort of, there's this, there's this there's gospel arc, we call it, that guides us from the beginning of the service to the end. And the idea is, is if you were to sit back, and you, you may not realize that this is happening every week, but it's happening every week. All right? If you were to just sit back and consider the different elements, the things that happen from the beginning of the service to the end of the service, it, fo it follows this sort of gospel path. It begins with a call to worship. God, the, the beginning of it is, is all about God. We, we consider God's glory, his holiness, his majesty. And then we move into a time where we, we, the, the shift gazes from God and his glory to us and our need. It goes from God to man. And then as we consider our need and our sin and our, our fragility as a people, then we reflect on Christ and how he meets us in our need. And then, as we leave here, we have an opportunity to respond to the gospel, to, to leave here with a sort of a call of action placed on our life. The, the gospel demands a response. And so, every Sunday morning, our, our church service will follow that arc, the gospel arc. And as you consider the different elements that sort of move us along that path, there's really four primary elements, and I'll, I'll just go over them quickly for us. You can read more on this if you want. But this shouldn't be surprising. The first is the reading and teaching of the Bible. 
No shocker there, right? When you come into this, this building, we love for you to come in with this book in your hands. As a kid, I've said it many times, one of the most formative things for me as a child was walking through the church and seeing men and women carrying Bibles in their hand because it said to me one thing. That book was important. When I walked in with my mom and dad and they had a Bible in their hand, I knew my mom and dad valued the Bible. And so on Sunday mornings, the Bible, this is what we're commanded to do, is to, to teach and to preach the Scriptures. 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Oftentimes I consider, sometimes what's un unfortunate is that it's, it's possible to have a worship service in today's day and age and the Bible to be nowhere present, to not see it, to not hear it, to not sing it. Several years ago, I was at the swimming pool, and as my kids were swimming in the pool, I just thought of how unusual the situation would be if all of the water just re was removed from the pool. Like, if you just think of, like, what the sort of motions are in the swimming pool, you know, kids splashing around. If everybody was doing exactly the same thing, but there was no water, it would be really weird. It'd be really weird. Like, what in the world is going on, right? The same could be said about a worship service that does not include the Bible. You can look at, your, look at it and say, what was that? What was that? Secondly, what else should we do when we gather? We should sing songs. Sing songs. Be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody to the Lord with, with your heart. Why do we sing? We sing, of course, in response to God's goodness and, and praise of Him and all He is and all that He's done. But singing, the Bible is, all, is very clear, is also an opportunity for us to address, to exhort, to encourage one another. And so just now at the end of that song, when the instruments sort of faded away and all you could hear was your glorious voices singing together, what you should have heard was your brother and sister singing gospel truth into your ears, being reminded of what God has done through the brothers and sisters as they sing in unison. Another thing that we should do, we should preach the word, we should sing songs, we should also, we're called to pray. Prayer should be another focus of what we do when we gather. Acts 2.42 says that the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. Our prayer time and the church service should not just be a sort of token thing to kind of kick it off and to wrap it up. Rather, it is another central aspect. It's, it's one of the four things that we're commanded to do when we worship. So it should not be relegated to just a token act on a Sunday morning. And then finally, the ordinances and the sacraments, specifically baptism and the Lord's Supper. Christ has given to his church two ordinances we call them ordinances. Sometimes you might hear them called sacraments. They're, they're called ordinances because they're commanded. Do these two things when you worship. They're called sacraments because in doing these two things, they mark us as God's people, as a special people. They, they distinguish us as a covenant people of Christ. They're signs, that is, they're visible, tangible expressions of the gospel and as such when we when we when we walk through the sacraments and the ordinances we are strengthening our faith and confirming and nourishing one another in our faith there's nothing saving about these but rather they they they, they provide for us a spiritual benefit as they remind us of the the reality of what christ has done in in, in is christ has done in his body for us and so one of the, the kind of ways that uh, you could think about what we do on a Sunday morning is we gather together, and this is one of the ways that my, one of my favorite um, scholars talks about what happens here. He says, we should read the Bible, preach the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible, and see the Bible. The ordinances and the sacraments are a wonderful way for us to visibly see God's word at work. So that's what we do. And so if this is so critical for us, Sunday morning, and I hope that you get that, how we worship really matters to God. And it's of the utmost importance for our, our formation and for our witness in this world. Um, then it's going to have some impact on us. God prioritizes it. Guess what? We should prioritize it too. 
If we're putting a bunch of other things ahead of it on our weekly schedule, that ought not to be the case. We need to prioritize worship on Sunday morning. We need to come prepared. One of the ways that we're going to help you do that is this year we're launching a whole church Bible reading plan. And part of that Bible reading plan is going to encourage you to come before the, the sermon is preached, before we gather as a people and having read the scripture in advance. Maybe reading it together as a family or with roommates or as a couple or, or just in your quiet time that day. Reading the word before you show up here. Come, come ready to receive from God's word. Come ready. Come ready to offer encouragement Think, walk into this building on a Sunday morning, thinking to yourself, who can I encourage this morning? Speak a word of honor or encouragement to your brothers and sisters when you come. Come ready to participate.